Hello and welcome to uh, this editorial spotlight event with Insider called Transforming the Norm. I'm your host, Shona Ghosh. I'm the Deputy Executive Editor at Insider Business. Uh, at Insider, as hopefully everyone knows, uh, we cover business, tech and life from multiple angles. Uh, and top of mind for a lot of people through this month of March is female leaders in the tech and the startup system. To recognize women's varied and often under-recognized accomplishments, women and men around the world celebrate International Women's Day on March the 8th. Americans celebrate National Women's History Month. It's also time for the UN's 67th Commission on the Status of Women. And this year's theme was Digital Innovation and Technology for Gender Equality. So with that in mind and for day, today's Spotlight Conversation, I'm delighted to welcome my two guests who are female leaders in tech. They are Michelle Yu, co-founder and CEO of Supercritical, and Oana Jinga, co-founder and CCO of Dexery. And they're going to talk with me about how education in the digital age can help achieve gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls, and how they got to where they are by breaking the glass ceiling in tech. Please feel free to submit audience questions using the Zoom Q&A widget. Uh, we will try our best to answer them towards the end of this approximately 30 to 40 minute event. You can also join the conversation using the hashtag insider events on Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever you like to share, et cetera. So Michelle and Awana, welcome. Thank you so much for, for joining this and doing this panel with me. Um, I'm gonna jump right in with some very quick icebreaker questions, but we can always dig in a little bit later. Uh, so my first question, um, Oana, why don't we start with you? Is there a glass ceiling within tech? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, we're definitely going to dig into that one. <laughs> Michelle, over to you. Yes or no? Yeah, I think that's pretty undeniable. Okay, we're definitely going to dig into that. And the next quick fire question is, which field in tech do you anticipate growing in the future? Um, it can be one year, five years, a hundred years, um, interested in your thoughts. Michelle, let's reverse the order and start with you. Um, in terms of which uh, sector of tech will see growth? Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we're in climate tech and I think that, you know, as time goes on and the climate challenge becomes more and more urgent, there's need for solutions. So I think that that's unfortunately going to be a growing sector of tech. And Oana. I should probably say robotics because that's what we're in, uh, but I'm I'm going to kind of diverge from there and actually th say um, human enhancement. I'm seeing more and more things kind of, did it kind of help us push our bodies and minds further? So I'm, I'm quite excited to see how that's going to develop over the next few years. Thank you both so much. Both super interesting um, answers to the questions. Uh, I am going to dig into the glass ceiling question. <laughs> um, you know, what is it, what is it that makes you what makes you think there is a glass ceiling in tech is your own personal experience, the things that you see. I would just love both of you to just briefly delve into that a little bit, um, even if it's a slightly uh, you know, troubling start to the conversation. It's good to be realistic about the challenges that that you know women and, and girls potentially face going into this field. Oana, why don't we start with you? I think both personal experience and just seeing actually yeah, the other kind of examples around me, there's still very, very little representation of women in leadership positions around the tech industry. Um, the, the amount of funding that women is are getting just, just for their businesses is much lower than the men. So there's definitely still an issue in terms of, of kind of having proper representation. Um, I think on, on a personal level, I was quite fortunate to work with some very, very strong women leaders across my career having like very, very good examples, but I could also kind of sense at multiple times the struggles that they were having to just continue climbing the, the ladder. Um, and for, for various reasons, yeah, they will always seem to kind of be stuck in, I would say mid to higher management position, but not really get to, to that board level uh, for a very, very long time versus some of the, the male kind of counterparts. So it's just, again, something that I've noticed quite, quite frequently. Michelle, is that something you've seen too? Or experience. Yeah, I would I would say that the 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 kind of the numbers speak for themselves. I don't know them off to hand, but you know the representation of female founders, CEOs, C levels, investors. I mean, everywhere you look, there's it's not 50-50. But as a second time founder, I would say that that has changed since the, my first time around starting a business in two thousand seven. I think the the awareness has changed and shifted, which means that um, the hopefully the demographics will shift as well following that awareness. Okay, so at least there's a positive note of where on a, a positive trajectory. Not fast um, enough, though. Not fast enough. Well, we'll definitely dig a little bit more into your own 
experiences a little later in the chat. Um, I'm going to continue with the sort of semi-icebreaker questions, which is, um, and this doesn't necessarily need to be work, but personally, um, what is your proudest achievement? Again, reversing the order, Michelle, let's start with you. Yeah, I, I think actually my proudest achievement is in selling carbon removal. You know, that's what we set out to do as a business. That's our North Star metric. It's a it's a field of nascent technologies that absorb carbon dioxide. And as a climate tech founder, that's something that, you know, as core to our mission. And we're now responsible for 30% of the corporate customers buying carbon removal to date. And we're very high up on the leaderboard of global carbon removal transactions. So that's something we're really proud of. Okay, so something something pretty recent. Oana, how about you? I think um, I'll probably move a, a little bit into, into the personal slash professional mode. Um, I think uh, as, as a founder, there's a lot of firsts. Uh, so every first for me is a very kind of proud achievement. The, the, the first kind of hire we made and somebody actually wanted to work for the idea that we had was quite quite remarkable. First customer you have that actually kind of pays money for what you're doing. First investor. Uh, first office so there, there's been a lot of first and I think every time there's a new first that uh, I kind of feel like prouder and prouder so just kind of seeing everything growing and and progressing um, and that kind of like fulfills both on a personal level because obviously you see all the effort put in, that you put in something coming to fruition but also on a professional because obviously yeah they're all kind of taking boxes for for the company. Just to continue that founder theme um, you know you both touched on this a bit you're right you know it's it's not super uncommon and it's increasingly more common to see female founders. More often it's common to see female co-founders. So we're often looking at lots of mixed gender teams rather than necessarily uh, solo female founders or all female founder teams, although those are becoming uh, more common too. Um, what, what made you decide to go down this path? It's, it's a tough, you know, whatever your gender, actually, it's, it's a tough job um, in that it's not really a job. It's a, it's a sort of calling almost, isn't it? So I wonder what made you decide, you know, going into this, that this is something you wanted to do. And before you started, how aware of all the challenges of being a, a founder were you in terms of it can be lonely. It's your own business. Um, Every, ultimately, the buck really stops with you. There's no sort of corporate necessarily in the background to to kind of hold you up when things go on. So um, what is it that made you go down this path, particularly given perhaps when you were starting out, there was there were even fewer role models for you than there are now? I think what's very funny is um, actually everyone kind of talks about, oh, you can be your own boss and you can do your own things and decide what you want to do. I don't think I've ever had less freedom than <laughs> after starting the company because you kind of get out of it as much as you put in. So you tend to just give it all <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh, so I was probably a, a little bit naive kind of starting it at, to, to the begin with, because I kind of saw this whole kind of my own future coming together and I could be my own. Um, yeah, just kind of set up the, the whole destiny ahead of me. And obviously that's not true. And there's a lot more complexities to it than you can ever imagine. Um, but I think I always kind of had this feeling that I want to build something um, of my own. Um, since I was a child, I, I don't know why I always kind of thought I'm going to have my own business. And it didn't happen immediately. Like I went into a corporate career, worked at some amazing companies, with some amazing people, but I was always kind of drawn back to the idea of, of yeah, having something of my own. And to your point earlier, probably, uh, yes, I am a co-founder. So uh, if it was just me, I don't know if I would have done it. I've got two other amazing co-founders that um, in a way, kind of we, we we continuously motivate each other every single day and we kind of got each other into into it to start with. Um, and, and I think that's much better than than being a solo founder because, yeah, I don't imagine how people can can deal with that considering all the pressure. Um, so yeah, going back to, to your, your question, I kind of always knew that I wanted to do it, but it wasn't until I found the right people and the right idea that I actually made the jump from the, the corporate world. Michelle, I want to go back to your first company, which was uh, Songkick, if I recall correctly, um, which is, you know, very beloved um, music tracking, gig tracking service. Um, and to, to return to that question of, you know, going into it, did you have a sense of the challenges of being a founder slash co-founder and, and what kind of drew you into that role originally? Yeah, I think, you know, we started to song kick in 2007 and we were probably in the second year of YC. So you have to remember back then being a founder and what that meant, starting a startup wasn't really a thing that was well discussed in numerous blog posts. So what really drew me to it was the idea of creating something and building something from the ground up, you know, at that time, I loved going to shows. 
I was a huge music fan and I wanted to create a tool that would help me and my friends do something that we thought was meaningful. And the more you start building something and seeing the results of it and getting users and people loving your product, kind of you realize how addictive that is. I think the second time around, I went in knowing exactly what the cost is and the hardship and it took me a really long time to feel ready to do it again. But what drew me to it the second time around was that feeling of knowing I could have impact very quickly and go up a really steep learning curve to create something in the world that I thought that should exist. What was your biggest challenge, would you say, Michelle, from that first time around that has informed, you know, the second time around? Um, The biggest challenge the first time around, honestly, uh, was starting a business in a market with incumbents and a monopoly. Uh, We ended up suing Ticketmaster for antitrust violations and winning a $130 million settlement for that with from them. You know, as a 25 year old founder, I didn't think about that. And one of the things I love about my company now and working in carbon removal is that it's a very nascent industry with no incumbents. I'm not against a monopoly that, that's preventing me from growing. And, and that was a deliberate, you know, decision going into the second business. That's pretty interesting. So starting where there's lots of incumbents as a first time founder is, is a tough old cookie of a challenge, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, this somewhat relates to the question, but in terms of technology as a field, because you could have been potentially founders in in any field, um, you know, what drew you to technology specifically? Um, you know, the, the question somewhat answers itself over time, but back in 2007, as you say, Michelle, um, it wasn't particularly common as a career. It was very much finance. You know, that's pre-crash. 2007, the crash is maybe about to happen, but people were mostly going into banking uh, after uni, if I recall correctly. So what is it that made you think that technology was the, the route that you wanted to go down with your entrepreneurial capabilities? Yeah, Michelle, I don't think it was... You. I don't think it was a deliberate consideration. I, I've always been drawn to technology. I grew up in the Valley. My parents worked in tech. And I think that the impact te- that technology can have on culture was something that was always really interesting to me, you know, from everything from social media to how we discover how shows are happening. And I think intuitively what drew me to tech was the ability to have scalable impact from day one very, very quickly rather than you know building a brick and mortar business where your impact doesn't grow as quickly. I think that that scale was what instinctively drew me to technology, but it wasn't something that I thought about very explicitly when starting the business. What did your parents do? Um, my mom was a VC and my dad was an engineer. Okay. And so were there, you know, computers lying around the house you yeah. know, when you were younger yeah. and you kind of got to play around any p- computer in particular, or was it more sort of being interested in the general atmosphere of tech or were you kind of playing my mom worked for apple in the 90s so we always had apple computers around um you know i was on the internet from a very young age um and i always found that connection to people and finding niche communities like just an amazing thing about the internet yeah definitely um oana how about you what what is it that drew you into um tech rather than necessarily sort of broader business or you know really any other sector I mean, just kind of building on what Michelle said, um, my parents were actually doctors and I've got seven doctors in my family. So there was no expectation whatsoever for me to do something different. <laughs> um, but I kind of yeah diverted from the path quite, quite early on, um, just from the moment like I decided not to go to medical school, which is obviously quite a big shock for a lot of people. But uh, it is what it is. Um, I was kind of like reflecting on that question a little bit and I, I don't know what when the actual moment happened I think um, again kind of going on to something that Michelle said as well that com- combination of culture and technology is probably what drew me to it I was one of the first kind of users of Twitter in like my group of friends and I was always like on, on social media and very quickly kind of understood the power of that uh, I was studying marketing at the time so obviously especially with the marketing hat on I just thought that that that's pretty much um, um, amazing just to kind of see messages kind of going um, from one audience to another and the power of it um, so when I kind of got my my first job, I actually was working for for Telefonica, which is a, a telecom company. So you can kind of like say it's more telco than tech, but they are quite advanced when it comes to digital products. And I was working on the digital team. Um, it all kind of like came together and it, it made sense to me. I just didn't really see myself doing anything else. Um, just going back to that power of technology to really kind of change the world, to connect people, to yeah, drive messages around whether they're right or wrong, but still just kind of the, the power that um, that tech has across everything we do every day. Both of you are obviously company builders. That makes you not just, um, you know, leaders on the corporate side. You're also managers. You have to hire people and, and build teams. And that can be, uh, and I 
certainly find this as a journalist who's also a manager, quite a different skill set to, um, you know, the corporate side of things. How much experience have you had yourselves in terms of having female bosses um, versus male bosses? Would you say that you've tended to have uh, male bosses sort of prior to prior to getting into startups? And, and, you know, either way, how has that sort of influenced what you do or don't do? I can definitely say there have been some uh, toxic male bosses I've had who have informed me how not to be a manager. So interested to hear sort of what the, the gender balance of your own previous managers have been and, and how that has or hasn't sort of informed the way that, you, that you've that you learned to manage. Um, Michelle, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. So before starting Songkick, I worked in the publishing world and both of my bosses were women in the two roles I had before starting the company. I think coming from publishing, which is uh, almost largely female, I didn't think about gender dynamics or, you know, not being represented and coming into tech, I was almost very naive around that. You know, I look around and kind of naively realize I was one of the only women in the room in any room I was in, and I didn't really understand it or think it, think about it, but that led me to a journey of kind of being aware of, you know, sexism and where it exists and, and kind of led me to my own kind of feminist journey. But it, I was very slow to it because my previous experience had been in like largely women dominated industries. I just want to dig into that a little bit more. Um, there's a school of thought that you can perhaps overthink these things, um, and maybe it's it's not good to think of yourself as a as a minority or disadvantaged. Um, I guess what would you say to that? That that you know, there's definitely some female founders who almost prefer not to think about these things. Um, did you have you found it to be an enlightening experience to think through these problems? Has it influenced your own behaviour to to kind of proactively think about it and not necessarily see it as you know something that should be ignored or kind of maybe not overthought? I think you can't fix it if you're not thinking about it. Um, you know, I, I would say I kind of slept, walked into song kick, not really thinking about the gender balance of our team or our investors or our hiring pipeline until quite late in the process. And once it's gone too far, it's too late to fix. I think there is a downside to being overly conscious. You can get very kind of almost uh, cripplingly, you know, paralyzingly aware of those things and it'll prevent you from being yourself or feeling confident. But you know, that was one of the things that I wanted to change with Supercritical. It was one of the things that we set out to do when we raised our first round of investment was to make sure that our cap table was gender balanced. And as a second time founder, I knew that that was something I could do, I had the privilege of doing, and I just wanted to make, get it done. Whereas I think as a first time founder, I didn't really think about it that deliberately and was just grateful to get investment. Um, but it's definitely a, a balance to be sure. I think that one of the things that I'm proud of is that our hiring team now is talking about our pipeline, wondering about how to make it more diverse, where they've never done that in their previous roles. It was never a topic of conversation. So I think if you're not aware and talking about it, you can't change it for the better. In terms of just again, to dig back into that, and I will come back to you on with the same question, but um, talking about your um, cap table, so so the investors from whom you've, you've raised money and now hold stake in your business, um, you know, a kind of common theme certainly in European tech that we we hear a lot about is um and you know any underrepresented community be it women minorities etc is actually that there's a relative you know when there's a dearth of people being represented they don't get rich they don't then go on to found their own companies they don't they don't sort of create this positive dynamic where they're affecting change by themselves being successful is that is that sort of what informed you're thinking around, you know, getting a, you know, more women in the capital, you know, what specifically were the benefits you were looking for there? Yeah, I think I, I came to that decision from my own personal journey, becoming an angel investor and realizing there isn't this secret special skill. It's just giving money to a company and your time and your expertise and kind of demystifying that for myself made me realize why aren't more women doing this? It's not some special club that you need an MBA to join. And then also working at a VC firm and seeing the economics, you know, they do aggregate towards the investors who make the returns and the exits. And if you don't have women as part of that community, they won't have the capital to invest in the next generation, won't be part of the ecosystem. So it was my small way of trying to break that cycle. I want to over to you on the, the sort of female to male boss ratio and, and lesson learn, lessons learned for your own management. Yeah, I think I was quite fortunate to have both throughout my career, both, um, I mean, males that were very, very supportive to, to other female colleagues and myself, but also some very, very strong female leaders. 
Um, so I think I've had a very kind of good mix of experiences uh, through that. And going back to probably been a bit naive just because I was in a bit of a bubble for, for quite some time until I kind of hit myself with the first uh, I would say signals of, of prejudice and, and obviously just the negative comments and it started with various kind of small words that you can start noticing and then um, some kind of bigger examples where I was like wait a second this is not okay um, and I think uh, yeah just being quite young and energetic you don't really think about it uh, but because to Michelle's point earlier once people start talking about it and start highlighting some things that are not okay, then you can start noticing them a little bit in your own environment. Um, and uh, unless like we, we take a bit of action to try and address them and there and then actually do something about them, they're just gonna continue. Um, so it, it's just something that I've become much more aware of, not to an extent that I, I'm gonna let it guide every single thing that I do. Uh, but the number one thing at least is that I try to address anything that I'm not okay with in the moment rather than kind of letting it fly by and then, think about it in the evening on my way home. It's like, I should have probably said something and just kind of let it ripple in, in uh, throughout after that. Yeah, so I really want to dig into that um, because as you say, it can be, you know, I think anything that comes as a shock, you don't necessarily respond to immediately in the moment. And then you think about later and go, that wasn't okay. So, you know, uh, just to give a concrete example for, for our audience who, who may find it useful to work through similar situations themselves potentially um you know is there a specific example of a time where someone it, it could be a man it could be a boss it could be a woman it could be anyone who who kind of held you back or disagreed with you or you know in some way sort of dismissed you or made you feel dismissed and you subsequently concluded i think this was essentially because I'm a woman and and really there was no other good reason um and if so can you kind of give us a little bit more detail on how you felt and reacted in the moment and you know how you came to that realization maybe that actually that was really not on and and here's how you'd respond next time and coming up with a plan of how you would respond next time oh Anna since we're continuing on with you let's let's carry on yeah I think it's a uh, it was very obvious <laughs> so it wasn't okay. <laughs> Uh, and I keep going back to it because I think yeah that was my moment of like realization that it it, it is still um, definitely not not female friendly to be in in the tech sector um, and it, just to kind of a small parallel as well like I said at the intersection I'll say of kind of three non-female friendly sectors because there's the technology side on the one hand the startup world and the investment world but also our company is in logistics which is still kind of very male dominated and we also do robotics which again as part of tech is still kind of um, yeah, very, very kind of heavily um, male dominated. Um, so I'll give an example, like quite a few years back when we we're just starting, uh, we were participating in a European um, competition. So just a pitching competition. Um, I think it was somewhere in Spain at the time. Um, and I was there kind of representing us and then doing the pitch. And uh, just before I went in, I think there was another about 50 companies pitching on the day. Um, and just as I was going in, one of my fellow kind of, yeah, other companies kind of being part of it, um, Kind of told me something like, "Oh, it's okay. You could just flick your eyelashes at, the, at them, and they'll just give you the money." <laughs> I was like, I literally just froze, and it's like, well, "Excuse me." <laughs> uh, first of all, yeah, I had never kind of considered of myself as, yeah, somebody who would be able to flick their eyelashes and get something uh, for any any reasons in the world. But um, it was just the, the negativity and the tone in which the comment was said. Just as I was about to go pitch, it was quite obvious that yeah, he knew that he was gonna hit exactly where it should and completely kind of mess up my my mood and my energy for for the whole pitch um and uh I didn't say anything so yeah I, I completely froze um went in did the pitch actually won um so I was uh, um, very very happy to afterwards kind of be named winner and when I was kind of like yeah presented with the award kind of looked the guy in the eye he just smiled and, and left the room but um looking back at it I just really wish I could have said something in the moment and not frozen so I think the the one element I've tried to do is just kind of have some I don't know, um, just words like say back or just kind of probably now after being through other similar moments, um, the, the shock wouldn't be the same as well because yeah, you could just like be a little bit more kind of keep your cool as you react in a way rather than just get a emotional and, and freeze. Um, but I, yeah, I should have probably kind of made it quite clear that um, we're all kind of there because we have been chosen for having some really amazing companies and he could flick their, his eyelashes as well if you wanted to. And yeah, of I don't course. know. You're, you're kind of like debating, yeah, should you be mean? Should you try and kind of educate people? Um, that's something that I don't think I've kind of like mastered yet. And it probably depends a bit scenario to scenario. But um, yeah, sometimes you just, uh, you're kind of debating, should I actually kind of try and 
educate this person and explain how that made me feel. Would they even care? Or actually, I should just be mean and reply back and, and carry on. So not something I've, uh, I've discovered yet what the best way is. Well, I think you definitely had the uh, the final mic drop moment, which is which is exactly. very good. But maybe something collectively for, you know, definitely not just you, but everyone to think about is actually we, we haven't quite figured out what you're meant to do in these situations. And that, you know, people understandably might fear blowback if you sort of go off and say things, you know, that's that's definitely a known fear. So I don't I don't think the answer is clear either. Um, Michelle, how about you? And actually, how would you have dealt with the eyelash uh, right. flicking comment? <laughs> I actually think it's not down to us specifically, but anyone who's around and hearing that comment, man or woman, to call them out and say that's like a bullshit thing to say. You know, I don't think it's down to women to defend themselves necessarily. Um, but yeah, I've definitely had my experience of sexism. Um, and I would say that one of the things that has consistently helped me is I've had amazing co-founders who come to my defense or correct people when they're saying things that are that are inappropriate or wrong. And I think that not feeling so alone in that in that argument is is very helpful. Um, on and, and Songkick's life, we had a an investor. Um, my two male co-founders were pitching, and they didn't realize that I was part of the founding team. And when they learned that I was, and that I was in a relationship with my co-founder, they were really angry about it. You know, they thought that uh, a couple in a romantic relationship couldn't be successful founders, but they didn't say it was about the romantic relationship. It was the woman specifically in that romantic relationship that was problematic, which was basically sexist because I never met that investor. And um, it was at that time, I was really young. It was hurtful. I didn't know what to say. I felt insecure. Um, You know, it makes you think that you're not supposed to be there. But now I think now that I'm older and more experienced, I would hopefully have a better response and call that person out. Do you think that kind of response is still common? There have definitely been, you know, tales of, again, maybe there's a mixed co-founding team and maybe the female co-founder is pregnant or has just got married and there's been some comments always from VCs um some questions to be asked there but uh, you know often an investor has has said you know aren't you going to have your hands tied up with a baby and you know which is a pretty appalling assumption to make but do you, do you still think that you know that there's some issues there essentially to address and that that there there are still some of these prevailing attitudes maybe it's behind closed doors so we don't always hear about it or do do you feel it's less common to hear these things I think it's less common because it's less socially acceptable there's been a lot of awareness around what's okay and not okay to say but I think that those thoughts definitely still exist and that's why one of the very early things we did at Sankhik, you know, before any of the big tech companies did it was to institute equal parental leave because I didn't want any women being discriminated against in the hiring process um, because a man was, you know, as 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 kind of able to take the same amount of time off. Um, and I think that's that is one of the things, you know, there's studies that show that that's one of the things that holds women back in their earning potential is because they do take more time off, time out, time out than, than men. And my, my male co-founder right now is on parental leave. So it's one of the things I'm proud of is that he can show that he can be a man and take time off for his, his newborn baby and be that example to the rest of our team. But I think that those comments are still definitely happening behind closed doors. Yeah, that's uh, troubling, isn't it? Uh, just to touch on your parental leave point, I think you're so right. Um, who came up with the the equal leave policy? Because I often find it, you know, even if it's going to benefit everyone, it's often women who are speaking up about uh, changing it to be equal, even though it will also benefit um, men. Yeah, it was definitely me. Um, our first uh, dad, you know, his he he came up for parental leave. This was in, within the first few early years of Sonic and. For me, my knee-jerk reaction, well, we had to make a parental leave policy. We didn't have one yet. And I said that we should have an equal one. And that took a lot of time and, you know, educating my my male co-founders and why that should be the case. We didn't get there in the first instance. And like it was a few years in before we were able to give it. Um, but it was, yeah, it was definitely me that that was aware of that issue and did a lot of research around it. Yeah, definitely. It's so interesting. The, the burden is is often on um, women still, but it sounds, yeah, I would love to see more companies adopt the same policy. Um, and just to just to continue with you, you've sort of touched on this um, a little bit so far, but, you know, really you were, I actually can't really think of many others, but you were definitely one of, um, you know, the first really prominent female founders, I think prominent in part because it was consumer tech. Songkick was very loved at the time. Um, is that something that you noticed? You sort of mentioned that you noticed over time, but you know, 
the more you went to pitch meetings and the more that you hired, you know, you noticed that actually there just weren't necessarily that many women on the commercial side, perhaps female engineers. Um, you know, how did that sort of strike you at the time in 2007 sort of onwards? It, the way that it struck me was it made me think a lot about my own educational path. You know, when I was a teenager, I actually coded my first website for fun for one of my favorite bands. And I didn't really think about why I didn't pursue that. You know, I didn't, I didn't really, I loved doing it. It was really fun, but I didn't interrogate. Why didn't I study engineering or computer science rather than English and philosophy? And it made me reflect on the kind of the gender norms I was probably intuitively following, but not really realizing it. And I just saw loads of men in the engineering department and decided it wasn't a major for me. And, and that, that made me feel really sad and, and feel like that's not, some, you know, it's not something that's within an individual's control. It's kind of a social systemic issue. Um, but I, it, once you start noticing it, you can't stop seeing it. And then, and then it's a matter of making sure that doesn't hold you back from being confident and feeling like you have a seat at the table or you have a right to the seat at the seat at the table and not letting it kind of hold you back from, from acting and, and feeling you know, like you're empowered. Yeah, Juana, well, I'd love you to, to speak on that same theme as well. It's super interesting, this idea of, of taking perhaps a more creative or commercial field before going onto tech and not necessarily coming from the hard engineering or computer science background. I mean, you know, to what extent do you think you would advise someone younger who's going into the field and thinking about what to study? Would you say that they should focus on science or maths or do you feel it's actually pretty easy to go from that more creative or commercial background in into tech without being you know you know the 10x engineer bro coder which is often the, the sort of stereotype of of what's required i mean with any company in the world right there's different types of things you could do you could be the one actually making the product which obviously where you you need the engineering skills and the coding skills like michelle was saying to build that website or code the I don't know, the, the program, build a robot, right? Um, but there's a lot of other functions to actually bring that product to market. You've got marketing, you've got business, you have even product management at the end of the day, which doesn't necessarily require engineering skills. So there's a lot of different things you can do in a tech company without being um, uh, kind of an engineer at, at heart. Um, the only reason I would say that um, any kind of, in, in a way, math or sciences or anything like that would be useful is especially as a founder it, it kind of builds a lot of that problem solving mentality and the problem solving attitude to life um which i think in a way my creatives kind of university studies didn't necessarily kind of push me down that route too much um so rather than kind of saying hardcore engineering anything that supports problem solving as a key skill of life i think it's absolutely essential whether that's done through education or so through any kind of additional um projects or programs um, like I used to go to scouts when I was a, a child and obviously as part of that it's continuously adventures and things that you have to do so kind of that that's shaped me a lot as a as a founder um, and as a business person uh, more than obviously just the fact that I've studied yeah, mathematics or physics at some point in my life um, so it's um, there's so many things that you could do in in tech um, that I, I don't think it requires just to have that fundamental specific education to it. It's just more like having that mentality that, yeah, I do want to bring something really incredible into the world and I might have some to solve some really hard problems to do that, um, regardless of whether they are, yeah, and you go to market strategy and pricing or actually, yeah, building the, yeah, the, the robot and fixing a sensor that's not working. <laughs> that's such an interesting way of framing it, thinking about building your problem solving skills. Um, I'm going to ask my final question, which is somewhat related. Um, so I'll ping it back to you, Michelle, to give Awana a bit more time to think. But, um, you know, if you were, you know, if someone came to you and sort of said, what's the one tool, um, hard skill, soft skill, programming language, anything at all, um, you know, that I should master if I think about going into tech, um, you know, right now, what would be your advice of being, you know, one, one area to focus? And this can be as broad or as narrow as you like. Oh, good question. I, I, maybe not text so broadly, but to be a founder, I think having taken a break between Songkick and Supercritical, when I started Supercritical again, one of the things that I forgot, but I was really, you know, happy to be reminded of is just the steep learning curve. You're always pushed out of your depth, having to learn something new that you, you're not comfortable with. And I think that that skill of getting to grips with something very quickly, getting your head around a new domain um, to solve a problem to Alana's point 
is basically the core skill set of being a founder. And that that is what I think is amazing about starting a company is that you you realize what you're capable of if, if you really kind of push yourself. And I would say that learning how to learn is probably the most important skill. Awana, anything to add? First of all, completely agree with that. It's like yeah, every single minute, sometimes you just learn something new. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Shoot, <laughs> probably should have. Um, but um, I, I'll go on to a bit of a different route. I think um, tech related in a sense, but but business world as well. Um, a, a very good skill is to actually understand what people want. Um, so I don't know, every time you build something new, you might go out to like an audience and say, okay, what do you guys want? And they'll probably say, oh, I don't know, or tell you something very simple and random and like, okay, there's got to be more to it. So trying to read people, I think is a very kind of key skill, uh, whether that's again, going back to my point earlier, because you have to like get a marketing campaign out there and know how to best communicate to them or because you need to build a new feature. Kind of going back to the, the old saying, like, yeah, if you asked them, um, people before the the automobile was launched like what do you want they'll just say faster horses right so <laughs> they'll never tell you this is what i want it's kind of really understanding how to unpick that and and get the right um kind of core core i don't know feature points or like exactly what how you can kind of solve that that desire i think it's a it's a very interesting skill to have um across any kind of um career but most importantly in tech when you have to service something to the world yeah, super interesting answer. So ability to unpack unknown desires um, and also a lifelong love of learning and and kind of knowing what you don't know and being willing to, to sort of tackle that. So um, great answers, unusual answers. So thank you. Um, and I want to say thank you both again for this great conversation. It's been super interesting to me, at least, um, I'm sure for our audience as well. So really appreciate the time um, and your honesty and insights. And thank you as well to everyone who listened in. The discussion doesn't have to end here. You can join the conversation and share your thoughts, as I said earlier, using the hashtag insider events on Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever you like to share. Business and tech are only some of the topics we cover at Insider, so make sure to follow us for our coverage and subscribe to our newsletters, including Insider Today and 10 Things in Tech. And don't forget to watch this space for updates about our April Spotlight event. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining. Thank you again to our panelists. Um, please make sure, if you can, to take our event survey, which will pop up on your screen any second. I've been Shona Ghosh. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much and goodbye.